Okay, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Those of you on, on the West Coast, good morning. Good afternoon to those of you here on the East Coast where we're expecting a hurricane potentially later today. This is billed as a Women in the Law event and we invite you to join us on uh, 925, September 25th for our Women in the Law conference. So I wanted to put a plug in for that. Today we have SCOTUS Focus Over Coffee and we have two legal powerhouses with us, Judy Brown, Professor Emerita Judy Brown and Matthew's Distinguished Professor Wendy Parmet. Both are nationally known and um, I will tell you a little bit about their backgrounds and then I'm gonna get out of the way and we're gonna hear from both of them on recent Supreme Court cases. Professor Emerita Judy Brown was one of the first women to serve as a law clerk to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and to be appointed to the board of directors of the Boston Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and to achieve the position of tenured professor at Newsel, where she taught for almost 30 years. Her focus was on equality for women and people of color. She helped found and remains actively involved in the Women in the Law program and the Women in the Law Conference. In 2013, Judy was selected to receive the prestigious Layla J. Robinson Award by the Women's Bar Association. She retired from Northeastern in 2001 and she now teaches constitutional law in continuing education programs at the University of Arizona and up until very recently at Dartmouth College. Now on to Wendy. Wendy is a Matthews Distinguished Professor, one of the highest honors bestowed by Northeastern University. She's a leading expert on health, disability, and public health law, and directs the Law School Center for Health Policy and Law, as well as its JDMPH programs. She also holds a joint appointment with the Northeastern University School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs in recognition of her national leadership in interdisciplinary thinking and problem solving on issues related to healthcare. In 2016, Professor Parmet was honored with the prestigious J. Healy Health Law Teachers Award by the American Society of Law, Medicine and Ethics at its annual conference. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions. Judy and Wendy have incorporated many of them into their conversations and we appreciate you submitting those. I will be back at the very end with a little five minute warning and a wrap for a wrap up. And thank you again for being with us today. Wendy, Judy, I'm so pleased you could both be with us virtually. I turn it over to you and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks for doing this today. Thanks for having us, Miel. Um, good morning, everybody from Tucson where it's morning and it's 103 degrees and no hurricane in sight. As a matter of fact, no rain in sight. So it's very warm here. So if this discussion gets a little heated, <laughs> you'll understand why. Um, this got started because this is such a confusing and perplexing time for the Supreme Court as well as for all of us. Um, and you know, every June when they get ready to get out of Dodge for the summer, they tend to release all the controversial opinions in a flurry. And as I read them this year, I was trying to figure out what was going on, what was going on. And even more perplexing to me was what all the pundits said. They were all celebrating the good news that Chief Justice Roberts had moved to the center, if not the left, and it was a new day and a new majority for the court. That made no sense to me at all. So many of you will remember that Wendy and I taught con law together for many years and we loved it. And we loved talking about the cases. So when I was confused, I reached out to my expert in the booth, Wendy, to see what she thought about what was going on. And that turned into this uh, webinar today. Wendy. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Miel, for organizing this. And it's just such a thrill to be continuing this conversation with Judy and have the opportunity to do this. We did spend so many hours, hard to imagine how many hours we used to spend, usually in Judy's office, never in mine, I'm not quite sure why, talking <laughs> about the cases and what was going on with the law. And but I have to say, my God, those did seem like the good old days, not only because they were the old days and we were younger, but thinking about this moment, and I think for me, I have to start this conversation by thinking about the moment we are in. We are in the midst of a pandemic. 
that is ravaging this country. We are facing an economic depression. The recognition long overdue, but still fraught of racial injustice. There is a loss of trust in our institutions that really seems unprecedented. We have unidentified federal troopers in city streets. We have the erosion of democratic norms. With so many crises and so much suffering and all of our institutions under stress, this year's Supreme Court term seemed especially fraught. And as we waited for the court's final decisions, and by the way, because of the pandemic that happened in July rather than in June, I think many of us wondered, you know, what, could the court survive? Could it maintain its legitimacy? Or would it go the way of all of our other institutions into division, delusion, and distress? And I think seen from that perspective, we need to say that the court managed to avoid the worst, right? It, it didn't descend into the same chaos that we've seen elsewhere, but it isn't clear to me that it managed to save the rest of us, even if it saved itself. Uh, I think the court did manage to avoid the worst of things, but what troubles me is the techniques they used in trying to avoid that. So I, I really have two questions that keep rolling around my head. Um, so con law 101, right? The courts are the final arbiters of the relationship between <laughs> citizen and government. And they're supposed to do that by balancing the importance of the individual's libertarian freedom based claim against the importance of the government's regulatory interest, all that great is good for the greatest number stuff. But I think the court has left that behind more often than not. And they're, they seem to be moving to what I wanna call categorical imperatives. And by that, I mean judicial pronouncements. It's not balancing, it's analysis by assertion, by announcement, by pronouncement. Um, is it an undue burden or isn't it an undue burden? You know, remember the old funny example about hardcore pornography? I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Now I can't define undue burden, but I know it when I see it. There are endless problems with this, which we will talk about later, I assume. But that's my first problem. My second problem is what is Chief Justice Roberts doing in the middle of this drama? He's clearly the leading actor in this drama, but what is he doing? Why is he doing it? And where is he coming from? But I think we should start with the pandemic because that is of all the crises, probably the most serious at the moment. And Wendy is a public health expert. Um, I need to hear you tell me more about that. I'm lazy, I don't read the stuff, I just talk to you. <laughs> well, thanks, Judy. Um, one of the most troubling aspects of the pandemic, and there are so many, is the extreme politicization, polarization that we have seen. Starting in April, the virus was increasingly understood in the United States through a political lens. And we've seen this consistently. And as the polarization increased, you know, remember when the president was tweeting for the liberation of Michigan, so did the litigation. And claimants, many or with organized um, litigation from groups, um, brought the cases pretty much under every constitutional claim you can imagine. It kind of like issue spotter, Tom Law 101 issue spotters, all of these social distancing orders, all of the orders, emergency orders the governors put in place, they were hit with a barrage of constitutional claims. For the most part to date, the lower courts have upheld the state orders. There are some interesting exceptions if we get a chance. But for present purposes, talking about the Supreme Court, the most salient case is one that came out on May 29th, South Bay Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, 
One of the many cases brought by religious groups arguing that state bans on in-person religious worship violated the free exercise clause of the constitution. In South Bay, the lower courts refused to enjoin Governor Newsom's order. The church then brought an emergency interlocutory appeal, a device, by the way, that the Supreme Court seems increasingly receptive to, at least when it's been brought by the Solicitor General. But in South Bay, the Supreme Court rejected the appeal without an opinion by a vote of five to four. Most interesting, Chief Justice Roberts sided with the majority and wrote a concurring opinion. The major there was no opinion at all for the majority. His short opinion made three points. First, deference is required during a public health emergency, not new ground. Second, Petitioners were not likely to prevail on their free exercise claim because there were public health reasons for the state's decision not to exempt churches from the orders that applied, for example, to stores and essential businesses. And third, well, this was an emergency appeal, so petitioners had an especially high burden. So in effect, no promises, he felt the same way on another day. But he did, in fact, a few weeks later, in late July, again by a five to four vote, the Supreme Court rejected another petition from the church, from a church, this time in Nevada, um, challenging a state order that limited church attendance to 50 people. Once again, no opinion from the majority, and this time silence from Chief Justice Roberts. But there were three vociferous dissents from Justices Alito, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch and all argued that by capping church services while allowing the casinos to be open at 50% of capacity, Nevada violated the free exercise clause. I have to say, Judy, you probably won't believe this, but I think they actually had a point, right? I mean, it's hard to understand what it, why casinos and bars are open right, while we're closing down churches. But on the other hand, if the Supreme Court had granted the order, it would have thrown the floodgates of COVID litigation even further open. And it would have made it very hard for states to respond to these re-emerging re surges of outbreaks. So I don't take the majority's silence as approval of Nevada's decision, nor do I take Roberts's that way, but rather a recognition that this isn't the moment and COVID isn't the place for the Supreme Court to push its agenda that we'll talk about in a moment about the free exercise clause. And here's where I will think my point about what Roberts is doing. He's treading water. He's trying, I think, amidst all of these crises and emergencies and crises of our institutions to keep the court afloat. If the court had ruled the other way, and two days later, there, you know, two weeks later, there had been a big outbreak of cases, right? There would have been deaths at his door. I think he's trying to keep the court afloat. Maybe he is about the churches, but he sure isn't about elections. Um, you know, the court itself wouldn't hold any public hearings. They did everything by phone because they were so concerned about the pandemic. But they forced the people of Wisconsin to stand outside in a line to vote as though COVID was nothing. And in several other cases where the states attempted to make voting easier, such as expanded use of mail-in ballots, the court justified its ruling by invoking that old precedent about you can't change the rules of the election, it's too close to the election it will be too confusing, no one will know what to do. Except as Justice Sotomayor pointed out in a wonderful dissent in the Florida case, the court did exactly the opposite. That was the case about Florida trying to allow um, felons, convicted felons to vote. So my point is this, the court has repeatedly intervened to block lower court orders that would have relaxed state election rules and procedures in light of the pandemic. And I find that hard to square with the religion cases. I mean, I will say cynically that Roberts is particularly bad, always has been on voting rights cases, but I think that's just too glib and too flip as an explanation. So- I, 
I agree with you. I mean, I think it's, you know, anybody who's saying that the court is moving to the center or Roberts is moving to the center or even, you know, a wee bit left of center isn't looking at the voting rights cases, right? It's, these are cases where the court has consistently, right, really voted against voting rights. Um, I want to get back for a second to the religious liberty okay. because this was a big theme for this term. And while the church did not win in South Bay um, or the COVID cases, which really are unique, right? I mean, crisis there. This was a great term for those who were pushing the free exercise clause, sort of wanting to read it increasingly expansively. For example, in a case coming out of Montana, Espinoza versus Montana Department of Education, Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the majority that the state that a state law that barred tuition assistance from being used for religious schools was unconstitutional. And in Little Sisters of the Poor, the court upheld the broad exemption that the Trump administration had granted to employers who objected to the ACA's contraceptive mandate. This is the, you know, what became of Hobby Lobby part three or something like that. And in Our Lady of Guadalupe, the court ruled that the ADA and the ADEA doesn't apply to teachers who have, who taught in church run schools. And for all the talk, therefore, about how the Supreme Court's coming out to the center, other than the COVID cases, which really are unique, both because of the public health crisis, but also Robert reminds us because of the procedural posture, they were not on the merits. The court has continually come through for the rights of religious groups. And I think we need to recognize that that's creating sort of a religious exception that may in fact um, weaken some of the other cases that we're going to talk about, where it looks like they're going, you know, in one way, but oh, there's a religious exemption. This, this is a, a, this trend to uh, allowing more religion in, in public life and allowing religious claims to defeat uh, what used to be called uh, neutral rules of general applicability uh, is it, very disturbing. I mean, They've been doing this for a while now, but since Hobby Lobby, which was 2014, I think, they've really picked up the pace. They've essentially written the Establishment Clause out of the Constitution, and they've elevated the Free Exercise Clause almost to a, a constitutionally legitimate excuse to avoid complying with laws that you don't like. So religious institutions now not only get all the benefits previously reserved for secular institutions, but they get special treatment as well. Uh, you know, I love Linda Greenhouse and she said recently, these are benefits without burdens, equal treatment morphing into special treatment. So here comes my point again about categorical imperatives. In Little Sisters, the court trumpets the language of individual freedom or the church's freedom or the individual little sister freedom uh, not to be a complicit in birth control. But while it, it really praises that claim, it virtually ignores the social compact. Um, so it doesn't consider at all health care for women employees or the very careful workaround in the ACA to, to compromise between the two positions. <coughs> And here comes the killer. When we get to the abortion cases, it's exactly the opposite. The individual's freedom to choose whether to carry a pregnancy to term is utterly subordinate to the state's regulatory interest. Um, once upon a time, way back when, from the New Deal, there was another Justice Roberts, Owen Roberts, who switched his vote and saved the New Deal. And that has become known as the switch in time that saved nine. Is this what Roberts had in mind in June medical services, the abortion case? The Louisiana statute up in June was virtually identical to the Texas statute, which the court had 
<coughs> thrown out four years ago in Whole Women's Health. Um, and Roberts dissented in that, he thought, in, in the Texas case. He thought that statute was perfectly constitutional. So when he comes to write his separate opinion in June, he says, I reiterate my dissent in the Texas case. I stand by it, but precedent compels me to follow the majority's ruling in that case, even though I don't like it. <coughs> that sounds wonderful. It's nonsense. When he doesn't like the precedent, he doesn't follow it. Voting rights cases, school deseg cases, especially voting rights cases. Um, also in that opinion, he, he reiterates several times, he is adamantly against balancing. I'm sorry, so here we are back to the lady of the tiger again. Is it an undue burden or isn't it? Is it hardcore pornography or isn't it? So the dissenters, <coughs> I'm not used to talking. I'm not used to talking so much. <coughs> Sorry, everybody. The dissenters plus Roberts in June Medical Services are really creating a, a new model, an abstract, artificial, inflexible decision-making process, which precludes any sensitivity to facts, to circumstance, to conduct, to context. This ultimately could ignore the legislative process and lead to the kind of judicial overreaching we haven't seen in a long time. It's profoundly anti-democratic. I have two more things to say before my voice goes completely about the abortion case. First, Indiana, similar statute, up next term and ready for the new non-balancing test. And Roberts plus the four dissenters is now a solid majority in favor of this categorical imperative, get rid of balancing test. Second, and this is perhaps more interesting. It seems to me that the court is angry and very polarized in the abortion case. The dissenters are angry because they thought they had finally had the votes to overrule Roe. And when Roberts didn't join them, they thought he betrayed them. Roberts is angry at the lower courts who thumbed their noses essentially all the way up um, at the Supreme Court's Texas opinion. So what's he afraid of? Um, again, he's the most fascinating player in this drama. Maybe we should look at some of the other cases and then come back to, to test some of these hypotheses. That sounds good. I just wanna quickly, before I turn to the cases, make two quick points uh, for what you said. First of all, I agree with you about the balancing, but you know, or they're moving away from that. But we've actually seen that a while, by this court in other areas. And I'm not thinking of this term. And so we're not gonna really talk about it because it wasn't big this term, but look at where the court's been going in commercial speech, yep. right? Um, moving away from intermediate scrutiny and really caring about the state's interest in health or safety, right? And moving more and more to strangely categorical and, and reductionist approaches. Secondly, I, you know, what you're saying about the court being angry and worried about appearances, I think that that explains a lot that's going on right now. And I'll go back to my point, you know, the court, so Robert's trying to tread water and save the court, or save himself maybe, if not the court. I think we see that a lot, appearances matter. Right, it's the one thing to overturn precedent. It's another one. It's goddamn, you know, just four years ago and almost a hundred percent on point. You can't even try to pretend it's different, right? You you, you want to kind of have some argument, some respectable argument, and you know he's trying, I think, to maintain. And I think we see that, for example, in Vance and Mazars, the two cases that can't the court decided late. Um, 
this term about President Trump's financial records. I think they really show the difficult political dance and the concern about appearances. In, in these opinions, Roberts begins with powerful payons to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. No one is above the law, right? Not even the president. We are bound by the rule of law. Powerful, compelling, important really important right now. I mean, you could imagine not having that. But I'm inclined to say he doesn't protest too much. Why does he even need to say this? Why does it and Why doesn't he acknowledge what we all know, that he has to say it because, right, we have a president who has claimed he has total authority, who has bragged that he could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue and get away with it. So, right, he has to sort of hold on to that appearance. But if the president is subject to the rule of law, um, why didn't he actually affirm the subpoenas and show the president that he actually couldn't get away with something? Instead, Roberts threw the case back to the lower courts and really gave the president a roadmap to challenge the subpoenas, almost assuring that the documents won't come out before the election. We might also know that the court refused to expedite the issuance of their mandate in the congressional case. Again, making it really clear that they won't, that the documents won't come out before the election. So let the me, court's not, Let yeah. me interrupt you for a minute. There's another sure. piece of Roberts that struck me every time, strikes me every time I read these opinions. He sounds to me like a trial judge presiding over a, a fender bender case. <clears throat> and he's really saying, can't you guys go outside, get a room and settle this? What am I doing in the middle of this? Why am I stuck answering this? Well, if I'm right, all he had to do was cite the Nixon case and Paula Jones, <clears throat> say the president is not above the law and uphold the subpoenas. So why this huge angst and outpouring? Um, I think you're right. I, it's, it's appearances matter. You know, as I, as I read those cases, I actually thought a little bit about Marbury versus Madison, right? I, you know, <laughs> in the beginning. Um, where judicial review began. And we could see in that case, right, the court, right, Chief Justice Marshall emphasizes, right, the role and power of the Supreme Court, but also docs issuing, right, the writ of mandamus. And in some sense, um, there's a little bit of that going on here, right? Oh, we have power, the president is beneath us, but we're not actually gonna challenge him. And, and you do wonder, is it because, to be cynical here, is it because they really don't want to go up to the president or because, and as I think perhaps was the case in Marbury versus Madison, they know that actually the president might ignore their mandate if they had actually issued it. And then what happens mm -hmm. to the appearance, right? What happens to the edifice and the institution of the court if the president just goes like this to the court. And of course, he sort of kind of has, you know, in the DACA case and other cases, he certainly is pushing it. And I, I get the sense that Roberts doesn't want to say the court doesn't matter, doesn't want to say there's no rule of law, but he also doesn't want to push it a battle he might not win. And that okay. again gets me back to my point, it's about appearances. I love your point about Marbury versus Madison. I mean, because contrary to what everybody learns in fourth grade civics, um, that case was as political a case as one could imagine. And we could spend an hour listening, listening all the reasons uh, by not answering the precise question, but asking a different question and answering that. Um, but the other thing about these cases, which takes me back to DACA is, Right after the court issued its opinion, Trump's lawyers rushed into court making the same arguments again. But Roberts also said, I'm going to give you a do-over and I'm going to tell you how to do the do-over. And of course, Trump's lawyers went step by step in raising the objections that 
Roberts told them. Isn't that exactly what he did in the DACA case? Well, I think absolutely, right? He's giving them a roadmap in some ways. And again, I don't, you know, I keep going back to appearances, but I think that some of the cases, the DACA case is a good example. Um, the census case from, you know. Sure. Back is a similar example of, look, I want a rule for you, but you can't, you can't make it this sloppy. You can't make the lawlessness this blatant, right? It's like, just guys, give me something I can work with, I imagine Chief Justice Roberts saying. Yep. You know, I, if you think about it, um, in the first big case of the Trump administration, Trump versus Hawaii, um, Roberts went with it, right? He, he overlooked the pretext. Well, yes, the president may have said all these bigoted, racist, ooh, disgusting things, but there's a national security finding in travel ban 3.0. I, I think what we see now is that, you know, he's really saying, don't make that fool of me, right? I mean, when you lie to the court as blatantly as they lied in the census case, when you, dissemble as much as they dissembled in the lower court in DACA. Like, you know, you're not helping me be a court. We gotta, we gotta keep the pretense up, you know? Folks, you gotta wear the suit. You gotta put on your, can't hang out like you're hanging out in Zoom when you go to the Supreme Court. You gotta make it look lawyerly. And, and if I don't make it look lawyerly enough, I'm gonna do it for you. So that's the Hawaii case again, right? right? You know, there's always two questions. Did the official have the authority to do it? And if he did, was what he did constitutional? So in Hawaii, Robert says, well, the president clearly had the authority to do it and now we can all go home because I can't answer the second question and come out the way I want to. So I'm just gonna hide behind the authority. And he takes that to an absurd extreme in the redistricting case. To say that federal courts have no authority to get involved in this because it's too political, because they have no expertise, but state courts do. It's my all time favorite Kagan dissent because she keeps saying, how come state courts can do it if the federal courts can't? Are they smarter? And Roberts never answers that. So I, I, I take your point that this is a, this kind of hiding behind appearances and begging the president to make his life easier has probably been going on for a few years now. And maybe we're now so concerned about it this year because Roberts is fed up, he's done. I, I think that's right. I wanna say that I don't wanna to totally discount the value of the appearances, you know? Right. One of the learned over the last few years is that norms matter, right? There were, right? It, it actually matters if the president says that he has always been a hey, right? Cares about the rule of law. Norms matter. And when norms break down um, and we are left with nothing but sheer power, that can be extremely dangerous. And so to some extent, while it sounds, um, like it sounds disrespectful to say Roberts is concerned with appearances, maybe a better way, a nicer way to him to say it is, he's concerned about maintaining the normative stance of the court in the United States. He's, in that sense, you know, he hasn't gone to the center, he hasn't gone to the left, but, He's just sort of back where everybody would have been, you know, right. six years ago. Like, we have a court, and lawyers are supposed to do their work, and judges are supposed to write opinions that sound like judges, and the president is supposed to follow the mandate of the court, although he can challenge it in, you know, octagonally. Yeah, yeah. Well, that seems radical right now. Yeah, and, and I guess it's also being a little bit I mean, the reasons that he comes up with, I keep coming back to the redistricting case, they're just silly. And he really shouldn't be putting himself in the position 
where law professors like you and me can make fun of him. Uh, he should be able to come up with something a little more substantive. And if he can't, maybe he ought to duck. Because uh, what concerns me too is the future of the court. And if people start laughing at the court for, for issuing silly opinions, that's really concerning to me. It's almost worse than kind of intellectual criticism. We are all entitled to, to spin out our little doctrinal fancies, but it's getting a little scary that he cannot come up with serious justifications for some of the conclusions that he's reaching. I'm really thinking out loud because this is, this is making me think about this in a different way and it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. I wonder when you say he can't do it, I wonder if what we're seeing is, you know, sort of the crisis perhaps in uh, conservative legal thought. There's been a lot of crises in, yeah. in progressive and, and, and radical legal thought, but the crisis in conservative legal thought, and, you know, I'm thinking now about uh, Stephen Calabresi, one of the founders of the Federal yes. Society's op-ed the other day saying, oh, what President Trump said is fascist. And was like, whoa, right? Yeah. Stephen Calabresi is now saying the emperor has no clothes. I, you know, I think Roberts is a small C, old fashioned country club conservative Republican. Exactly. Right? Exactly. You know, you, right, I mean, appointed by President Bush, right? I mean, and he fits into that. He's not a movement conservative and he's not a Trumper conservative. And the problem is what's left, right? What's mm -hmm. left of that world he is in? he is from, what is left of that belief system, and what is left of the intellectual and ideological um, world in which they, right, the, the tools that they had. And I know we're going to talk in a second, I think you're going to talk a little bit about Gorsuch's opinion in, in Bostock, but what's left of those tools, right? Of holding on, what's 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 left of originalism? If what's, you go and say now that the president can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, is that what originalism and unitary executive was supposed to be about? I think they're struggling right now because maybe we are coming. They are coming to the end of the line of of where that, you know, think Bill Barr. Where did that intellectual tradition lead? And can you, is it an intellectual tradition anymore or is it just about a party in power, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. I think for me, I, that also gets me to where Gorsuch's opinion, but I know you yeah. want to. Yeah, that gets me there too. But before I get there, um, I, I just keep thinking O'Connor, who was the same kind of country clubs, small C conservative, um, was and we once I wrote about her together. Wrote an article about that, and the working title was "Country Club Feminist." Although we couldn't do that, so we changed it to something more tedious and boring and respectful. No, um, no, we had a good title. But she was replaced by Alito, and Alito is a totally different kind of mind uh, than O'Connor. But we should talk about our originalism and textualism because we need to talk about the. LGBTQ case, and that's at the heart of it. So to give it credit, um, originalism, textualism, all of those theories are an attempt for the court to say that it is making decisions in a value-free manner, that it's following an important rule of constitutional interpretation and their biases don't make any difference because the rule is inexorable and powerful and drives them to a conclusion. Um, that's nonsense. 
And it's nonsense for several reasons. One, originalism, uh, as you all know, no, you've all heard me say this and Wendy say this until we're blue in the face. Constitutional interpretation cannot be value free. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said that as early as 1918 in a Harvard Law Review article. Um, it's impossible to know what the framers of the constitution meant. It's impossible to know what the drafters of a statute really meant uh, because those are political compromise documents. And that is probably their enduring strength that they were the product of compromise. Individual framers, individual legislative drafters might've had very different things in mind. So textualism is like the cousin, I guess, the new cousin with Gorsuch on the court of originalism. And it's the same idea. Fidelity to text is so important that it does not permit of any other result. Anybody who reads that text must come out with the same answer about its meaning. And again, that's really silly because in the Title VII case, the majority and the dissent construed the words discrimination based on sex in exactly the opposite way, both claiming fidelity to the text. Uh, so the interesting question is, is really what you're suggesting. Why is, why are some right thinkers, right leaning legal thinkers now disowning the Gorsuch opinion? Who knows? Are they just upset at the result? Um, have they finally understood that both textualism and originalism are inherently subjective? And that of course cuts, cuts the underpinning of the power of those theories away. Um, the interesting thing to me is the lawyering, the craft of lawyering in that case by Pam Carlin at Stanford. She understood that there were two cases that the court could have used, two sexual harassment cases, Meritor and Onkali, the same se sexual harassment case would have led them to the same result. But Carlin understood that simply urging the court to follow those two cases would not get Gorsuch's vote. And she also understood that Congress's repeated reluctance to add sexual orientation or gender identity to the list of protected classes in Title VII cut strongly against her. But she did one more thing. She read Gorsuch's book and she read it very carefully. And she took him page by page through his book. And every point he made, she argued, supported her interpretation of Title VII. You know, I'm really sorry I retired because if I were still teaching Title VII, I would spend many days on this case just showing students what brilliant lawyering can really do. But I think balancing also plays here, again, in terms of rejecting uh, traditional forms of constitutionalis constitutional analysis. I think balancing is even more important in the hard cases, the cases where there are two um, conflicting individual rights. So maybe that's a way to look at um, little sisters or abortion, religious freedom issues and privacy issues. And I think it's especially critical for the court to do some extra careful balancing in those cases. You know, homes, hard cases make bad law. Um, I don't know, I know that one of the questions that was submitted to us is, well, what's gonna to happen to the whole LGBTQ rights movement after postdoc? Not a lot, I don't think. I, th I'm, I, I think the case is so tied up with Gorsuch's textualism theory. <coughs> I'm not understanding how it can be readily applied in other cases. I hope I'm wrong, but I can't see the leap to other cases, can you? No, and I think we also need to circle back to where we started a little while ago with the a collision co course between Bostock and the free exercise and reef for a line, yep. right? Because 
you know, if you look at Little Sisters of the Poor, what you realize is that basically I'm a believer is an absolute, you know, get out of Title VII card. It's like get out of the ACA card. You don't have to show anything. You don't right. have to do anything. That's it's what I mean by categorical imperative. You no, know, well, it's too burdensome to even ask you to explain why you don't want to do it. So, you know, both stock doesn't get you too far if everybody who wants to object can just say object. Um, but I, I want to mention another point about your originalism point, because it, it does seem, you know, one of the, th we might recall that Scalia was, it was often said of Justice Scalia, well, you know, he takes his originalism seriously and every now and then you get a decision that goes against sort of the Republican Party platform. And, and, and I do take it that my sense is that maybe Gorsuch wants to, you know, be a Scalia. Again, it gets harder and harder as the platform is going further and further, right, way to the right to hold on to the methodology that you purported to follow neutrally. Because if you can, of course, we're all good lawyers here. We all know we try to be. We all know we can, you know, take any methodology and get us any doctrinal result we want, but it starts becoming pretty convoluted and complicated. And again, if you wanna hold on to your methodology, um, then occasionally you gotta stomach an outcome that may not be you know, with the party platform. And the problem is the party may not like that, but if, you, if you're gonna, at least try to claim that originalism is a methodology and it's not just a fig leaf for sort of the conservative legal movement that every now and then you got to toss, you got to go the other way. Or, so it, or every now and then you have to redefine what you mean by originalism. Um, abortion again, the date that Scalia uses for originalism is often a moving target. Absolutely. Um, Abortion was readily available during the framing period. So Scalia doesn't use the framing period. He uses the late 19th century when states were starting to criminalize abortion and when midwives were no longer in business because they were uh, replaced by doctors. So the date then in Scalia's, everybody knows abortion was always meant to be illegal, is the late 1800s. That's not what originalism is supposed to be. I got I got to do a plug here for a paper that I, I wrote with our colleague Claudia Haupt because we looked at some of this with respect to speech and commercial speech. And here's the thing with that one, it's not the Supreme Court, it's lower courts, but they go right back to, you know, it's, it's 1781 because if you actually look um, to the 19th century, there's all kinds of, you know, health and safety laws, right? So yeah, it's a moving target um, and they can find it where they want to find it. Um, but again, I think that in this particular case, in this particular term, we're seeing sort of the clinging to the pretense or the appearance mm -hmm. of, a neutral rule of law is becoming very important. So Judy, where does this leave us? <laughs> is the best thing that we can hope for right now in this really difficult time, some semblance of normalcy from the court in a otherwise crazy world? Is that as good as it gets? Well, I wanna add one more thing to your question before I even attempt to answer it. It seems to me the court has another function as well. And that is to give guidance to the bar, the lower courts, uh, law students, lawyers about what they're saying. And as the high court, they should also, I think, care about how the American public reads and understands what they're doing. Um, and that I think this kind of button, button, who's got the button hiding behind some of this stuff is especially damaging to the court. Uh, we all know because everybody says so who writes about the Supreme Court every day that Roberts cares about his legacy. To me, that means two things. 
I think he cares about his personal legacy. I think he wants to go down in history as as wise as Solomon, as objective and neutral, uh, just the best chief justice that ever was. Um, and that perhaps explains some of his moving around this term. But I think what explains it more is his concern for his institutional legacy. It's your point about how he thinks he needs to save the court. I'm not sure that he's going about it in a way that will save the court, but I think he feels compelled to do that. I think he feels compelled to protect the court from Trump and McConnell, who are saying, obviously, we need judges who agree with us. That just blows away all the Solomon objectivity, judicial neutrality. Uh, very crassly, I think Roberts is saying, I am not a hack. I don't want to be a hack. Stop making me a hack, and I am not a hack. Remember Nixon? I'm not a crook. Now we have Roberts. I'm not a hack. What do you think? No, I totally agree. And the, the irony of that is that McConnell um, might have gotten more of what he wanted from Roberts if Trump had not been quite so Trumpy, so to speak. Yeah. Right? Because the more Trump is, you know, tweeting about Trump judges and Obama judges, and the more it's right, everything he's doing is so clearly showing the that he doesn't respect right, at least the charade of formal etiquette and rule of law, the harder it is for Roberts, I think, and many, many, I, it's not just Roberts. I think, right, we need to recognize that there is a group in the sort of legal establishment um, who are finding, right, the president's style and way of doing things, even if they agree with him on the substance anathema. And, I think so. Ironically, Roberts has to not go all the way, right? Um, and I wonder too, just not to be too cynical about this, but whether what we've seen in the last couple of months with more and more of some of the establishment, not the, not the congressional Republicans, but the establishment Republicans, you know, from Stephen Calabrese to um, the Lincoln uh, project. If we're seeing more and more of these establishment Republicans moving away from Trump, whether that doesn't make it easier or even more compelling, right, for Roberts to assert some independence from the administration. It's important to say that if that's what's going on, um, that's not Roberts moving to the center or the left, but it is Roberts trying to create some space um, at least until the election, right, from the president. And again, some attempt to maintain, right, the institution of the court and his place in it. What I think is very scary to me right now is how far does this go if we end up with a contested election? Right. And, you know, Bush versus Gore. I mean, what happens? Is he going to be that independent voice or when, you know, the rubber really meets the mat and the question is who's, who's in power? Because as you said, we, we went through a whole lot of cases where we see Roberts trying to be at least a few degrees of independence. But as you said, Judy, not in the voting rights cases, not in the cases about the electoral college. Right. Right, and and the scary thing for me, um, in this five, time of crisis- Five minutes for summarizing, you guys are doing a great job. Okay, um, all these crises that Wendy listed at the beginning, people are scared. Um, it, norms are being destroyed. Uh, and the last time I can remember that happening was during the McCarthy era and a couple of important left-wing historians, um, Max Lerner and Eric Goldman at Princeton wrote a book that has always stayed with me, which is in times of crisis and, and times of 
uprooting norms and being cynical, it's very important to restore the national mythology. George Washington and the cherry tree, the American flag, and all of that stuff. Because if we get too cynical and we wash everything away, um, every poll you read about the Supreme Court shows that people think it's overly polarized, overly politicized, they're losing respect for the court. Um, that's very scary. And so maybe Robert's trying in his own limited way to restore um, a solid, stolid, staid view of the world um, as a bastion against Trump and rabble rousing and troops in Chicago and Portland uh, becomes increasingly important. And maybe we're not giving him, I hate to say this, but maybe we're not giving him enough credit for what he's trying to do if we're right about what he's trying to do. But I'm with you, all bets are off if the election is contested. That's gonna be really scary. <coughs> Here we go again, Bush versus Gore. Yeah, well, as we come to the end, I'm with you, Judy, as usual. Um, you know, I think, I think we're, this conversation brought me around to thinking these appearances do matter. They may only yeah. be appearances, but we've seen in this country what happens when we lose them, when we lose all of our norms. And um, it's, you know, again, it, it may not be enough to save our nation, but if we lost even the appearance of the Supreme Court as a court, if it really just became sort of a, you know, executive committee of the Politburo kind of thing, um, we'd be in an even worse shape. But yes, elections, what will happen if this court um, decides the election? Will its decision be greeted? And let me end with this. When, when the court decided Bush versus Gore, I think many of us who had, you know, studied the court knew it's equal protection doctrine, we're really shocked and appalled at the decision and it's, it's disregard of precedent. But the country accept, Al Gore and the country accepted the decision. It had enormous legitimacy. President Bush didn't go into office with question marks, right? With half the country thinking he was illegitimate. The court had legitimacy even if we questioned how it reached its decision. I think we should be very worried that that legitimacy, which at the end of the day is what a democracy needs. It needs its norms, it needs legitimacy, it is imperiled. And if, if, if Roberts is trying to pump it up a little bit, you know, more power to him. More power to him. Let's see what happens if a contested election, will that legitimacy be there? key, key question in the months ahead. I, you're absolutely right. I'll tell you a funny story, which makes me believe that you're even writer than you usually are. Um, my husband, Jim, was appointed to a very fancy board and we were having dinner with the board president the day that Bush versus Gore was decided. So I met everybody at the restaurant being just appalled by what the court had done. And the board chair said, the court saved freedom as we knew it. And my husband kicked me so hard under the table, making me shut up that I was black and blue for three days, but he was right because everybody went along with Bush versus Gore. And I'm afraid today that people might not, it, it's your point, if the court loses legitimacy in the eyes of the public, um, all is lost for, for, for democracy. And that's very scary. What a way to end. Yeah, Judy, we gotta do the way to do it. Yeah. An up note. <laughs> wow. We need, more up, we need a more upbeat one, right? Yes, we'll, we'll do a happy one next time. How's that? What Sounds a good. discussion. What a discussion from both of you. I wanna I wanna take your class. This was fantastic. We're getting wonderful comments in. A couple of people are praying for Ginsburg, myself as well. We didn't touch on that at, at too much, but we'll, we'll pray she stays healthy. I think this should be an annual event. You both did such a great job. I felt like I was in your offices. 
One more quick plug for Women in the Law, the conference on September 25th. I hope you all will join us. Big round of applause for Judy and Wendy and your thoughtful, thoughtful summaries of what is going on um, in the Supreme Court and some of the most recent cases. Do either of you have a final word? Thank you, Miel and Judy. Got to do this. Got to keep talking. Thank you, Miel, for giving me the chance to work with Wendy again. It was wonderful. I really, I love working with her. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed being inside both of your minds again. So thank you. And maybe an annual event. So much love to both of you. Judy, stay well out in Arizona. Thank you to our viewers who joined us. We had quite a few today. So thanks for that. Everybody stay healthy, stay well, and we'll see you again real soon. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.